Hello everyone and happy holidays! Thank you for tuning into Video Entertainment Studios for this episode of Video Movie Reviews. I'm the Nerd Lust Daddy, and today we continue our series reviewing every North American live-action video game film adaptation theatrical release. Today, for one last time, we find ourselves once again boarding the Paul W.S. Anderson train, regardless of it having left the tracks long ago, as we review 2017's Resident Evil The Final Chapter. Oh, chit -futter. Not these films again. Well, Pids, at least this is the last of them. Maybe this one will be a half-decent send-off, so let's jump into this one and find out. Now, Resident Evil The Final Chapter was released in North American theaters on January 27, 2017. At this time, 24 games had been released within the series in combinations of mainline releases, spin-offs, and remakes. As usual, we'll be sticking with the mainline releases for comparison. And those are Resident Evil, Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, Resident Evil Code Veronica, Resident Evil Zero, Resident Evil 4, Resident Evil 5, Resident Evil 6, and Resident Evil 7 Biohazard. As usual with this series, we'll just be using these for a loose comparison as the films jumped the tracks a long time ago. Regarding the plot of the games, we've gone over that enough already, so let's just keep this brief. The Umbrella Corporation, a worldwide pharmaceutical company, experiments with the T-Virus and intends to use it as a biological weapon and sell it to the highest bidder. This virus is capable of turning humans into zombies and mutate living animals and plants into monsters. They begin their work in a secret underground laboratory that is located beneath the fictional Raccoon City, which also serves as the setting for many of the games. The T-Virus eventually gets loose from the lab and eventually spreads across the entire world. Many characters recur within the series, such as Albert Wesker, Leon S. Kennedy, and Claire Redfield, to name a few. In this final entry to the Paul W.S. Anderson film series, we pick up where the last film left off opening with a flashback that shows Dr. James Marcus, the founder of Umbrella, had a daughter named Alicia that was dying of progeria. He co-develops, in partnership with Dr. Alexander Isaacs, the T-Virus to save her life and quickly learns that it can also cure many of the world's other life-threatening illnesses. Unfortunately, unforeseen side effects are revealed when a young boy treated with the virus dies, turns into a zombie, and attacks others around him that also get turned. Dr. Marcus insists that they shut down the T-Virus project while Dr. Isaacs wishes to move forward despite the risks. Realizing that Dr. Marcus will not give in, Dr. Isaacs murders him to continue the project for its potential and profits rather than suffer a development loss. This causes Dr. Marcus's daughter to inherit 50% ownership of Umbrella as well as Dr. Isaacs gaining parental rights to her. Back in the present, we see Alice emerge from the rubble of the Capitol at Washington, D.C. After a daring escape from multiple T-Virus mutations, she finds herself in an underground bunker where the Red Queen contacts her and informs her of an airborne antivirus that is located within the hive that can kill the T-Virus and anything infected with it. But she only has 48 hours to reach and release it before the last remaining humans in the world are killed at their outpost, which would essentially cause the extermination of humanity. Thus, Alice sets off on her quest to reach the high, acquire the antivirus, stop Umbrella once and for all, and save humanity from extinction. So I didn't go over every plot point because I didn't want to spoil some specifics. But first off, you can see from the plot point of the Red Queen wanting to help Alice and stop Umbrella that there are some serious contradictions. In the last movie, it was made clear that the Red Queen was now operating autonomously and saw humanity as a threat that needed to be exterminated from the world. Some other plot points come up, including issues dealing with Alice's current T-Virus status, that while fitting within Umbrella's end goal, our character aspects or corporate motivations or influences never brought up during this entire series until now or that contradict previously mentioned events. It's almost as if W.S. was just making this shit up as he went along so that he could keep churning out more films. There's just too many contradictory and eye-rolling things within the plot of this film to give the plot a pass at all. I've got to give it a chit-futter. Pitts, what did you think of the plot? Chit-futter! 
Okay, what about our setting and world representation? The cinematography is good and presents a post-apocalyptic world accurately that has been ravaged by this virus and overrun by the mutations caused by it. Speaking of the mutations, we get plenty of zombies, zombie dogs, and other mutations, even if some of them are original to the film series or altered interpretations of those within the games. Umbrella itself is accurately represented, but I have to say it's not too hard to accurately represent a cold corporate entity, its members, and its locations and logos. The characters themselves look more or less fairly accurate to their in-game versions this time around, but we only have Wesker and Claire to go off of when discussing this aspect. Still, overall, I can give setting and world representation a hawoo. Pids, what did you think of setting and world representation? Hello. Alright, let's jump into the characters and keep it to those that are main characters from the games and those front and center of the film plot. We're going to skip talking about a bunch of them because they were only added to this film just to increase the body count. One notable mention is Abigail, played by Ruby Rose. Now this actress is seriously underutilized and her character is underdeveloped in this film, wasting her talent. She needs to be given her own action vehicle as she's fantastic as an action movie actress and deserves more screen time. Anyways, stepping off of my soapbox, let's start with Albert Wesker. Portrayed by Sean Roberts, known for his roles in other B-movie zombie films such as Land of the Dead and Diary of the Dead. Here he plays the iconic Wesker from the video games, an ex-Stars member who secretly was an Umbrella plant intended to keep an eye on law enforcement for Umbrella. As always, Roberts is fantastic in this role. He seriously hams it up and is deliciously evil and sadistic as Wesker. I love this portrayal and can easily give it yet again another hawoo. Pids, what did you think of Wesker? Hawoo! Claire Redfield, played by Ellie Larder, probably most notable for her roles in Varsity Blues, Final Destination, and the television series Heroes. Playing the iconic Claire Redfield, she unfortunately fails. It's not her acting abilities that cause the failure here, it's the written and physical representation that again is so far off from the games that I just can't approve. The performance is good, but considering this character is taken straight from the games, it needs to stay at least somewhat close to its origins, yet never has for this entire film series. An unfortunate chip futter from me here. Pids, what did you think of Claire? Chip futter! Dr. Alexander Isaacs, portrayed by Ian Glenn, known for his roles in a previous movie we reviewed, Laura Croft Tomb Raider, as well as his role in Game of Thrones and currently as Bruce Wayne in the television series Titans. In this film, we see him portray Dr. Isaacs, the malicious and cold CEO of Umbrella, who will do whatever it takes to see his goals of worldwide genocide achieved. As usual for Glenn, when he's on screen, he chews the scene up with his fantastic presence, consisting of poise and eloquence mixed with sadistic delusions and unquenchable thirst for power. He's fantastic in this role, and I can easily give Dr. Isaacs a hawoo. Pids, what did you think of him? Hawoo! Alice, portrayed by Mila Jovovich of the Fifth Element fame and, of course, every damn Paul W.S. Anderson Resident Evil film ever made. She reprises her role here as the original character made for the series. And while she seems engaged with the character and brings a heavy action film presence and abilities, unfortunately the contradictory script does her in here. It contradicts things set up in the previous film that again create a situation where her fantastical abilities to survive and pull off some of the things that she's capable of make absolutely no sense now. I just cannot give her a pass as the entire existence of her abilities and thus her existence in general make no sense. She should be dead by now. I have to give her a chit futter. Pids, what did you think of Alice? Chit futter! time for the final verdicts. So we have a plot that fails here due to contradicting itself in regard to what previous films have taught us. Setting and world representation hold up as it provides accurate representations of settings, groups, and events, and the characters are mostly lacking in that most are just added as body count fodder or are disappointing representations of their video game counterparts. Let's turn to the Pids first for his impressions. Pids, what did you think of Resident Evil The Final Chapter? Ah, well. I'm with you there, Pids. At that, this gets a barely passing hawoo. 
This film way too frequently contradicts plot points and character aspects firmly set in previous films. It seems to come off as something that was just haphazardly written to just churn out another film in the franchise. The only saving graces to this film are its setting and representation, a couple of the characters, Wesker and Dr. Isaacs notably, and the non-stop action that save it and make it at best a popcorn flick worthy of an evening viewing if you have nothing better to do. At the absolute most, I can give this a 5zs out of 10zs. But in the end, I cannot with good conscience recommend this film to fans of the Resident Evil games, and at the very most can only recommend this to fans of B-movie action horror style flicks, but it's not even an above average one of those at best. I'd say if you're already invested in the series then finish it out, but otherwise proceed with caution. The Pids and I want to thank you all for once again tuning into Video Entertainment Studios for this episode of Video Movie Reviews. If you enjoyed our video, please be sure to comment, like, subscribe, and share to show your support. And don't forget to also check us out and subscribe on Twitch, as well as follow us on Twitter. Until next time, I'm the Nerd Lust Daddy, as always reminding you all to not be chit fuckers to each other. Body autonomy for all, reproductive rights for women, and peace, love, and happiness to all. Pids, take us the hell out of here. Thank yous all again for watchings. We'll see you again next time. <laughs>